Today we're going to do a courageous man, foolish man, who draws their sword. I bought this online, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, just wanted to, as uh, I thought I'd slowly try to collect different pieces of the set of, of armor. What I was trying to get with the Bible says the armor pieces, like they always say the belt. Uh, it's not a belt and the armor of God. It's you gird up your loins with truth, the sword. You gird up your loins so the sword can hook on there and you have the sword of truth. And it's talking spiritually. Um, it's talking about the Word of God. Okay. When you gird up your loins with truth, it's called 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. You study you put, hide God's word, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay? You take the word of God and you hide it in your heart and you live it. That's what girding up your loins are. You gird up your loins when you're doing work, study. You're girding up your loins when you're doing battle. Remember, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay? So today we're going to talk about it. Who drew, all this, who drew the sword? So turn to Matthew 26, 46. Turn to Matthew 26, 46. Who draws his sword? Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Jesus Christ, they're in the garden. He's praying. The disciples are falling asleep. And he comes back and says, okay, Judas Iscariot's here to betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave him a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Okay. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then come they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Here it is, verse 51. And behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword. If I can get it back out. Drew his sword. Okay. Behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Just took off his ear. So whoever it was that was using the sword... Wasn't very good at using swords. All right. We'll get to who it is, but we got to remember 2 Timothy 2.15. High priest is smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, put up, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Oh yeah. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Now, when we get into this study, Brother Sister Christ, I'm going to link. Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries did a study a long time ago called um, Self-Defense in the Bible. Now, I believe, Brother Sister Christ, someone comes through that door with like trying to steal an intent to hurt you and your family. Uh, by all means, I'm talking about an individual. By all means, self-defense, self-defense. But as we're going to read here, when it comes to the government, when it comes to the powers that be, that God has ordained and allowed to be in charge, when it comes to the mob, <laughs> the mob, uh, we need to trust the Lord. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the Lord, nobody can come in here, to my home, nobody can come in here and hurt me without God's permission. Nobody can. And we're going to see this as we go through this study. But you see what Jesus said, they that, that live by the sword, I want to make sure I'm reading it right, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. What he's saying is, is we're supposed to be defensively defending ourselves. Someone breaks in to steal, someone breaks in to hurt your family, defend yourself. But we're not supposed to be going out and being offensive. You're going to believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to do what the Bible says, and blah, 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 hack. Hack! There goes another year! That's not what the Bible's talking about. That's false religion. That's Catholicism. 
That's not true biblical Christianity, okay? We do not go out offensively a fighting an attack. We're going to go down guns blazing. Today we have guns. We're going to go down swinging. Is that supposed to be for us today? Okay. So, Jesus says we're not to live by the sword. Granted, we can have self-defense. I'll link the study to it. But today we're going to be talking about who this man is. And we're going to be talking about some other men. Okay. So, it doesn't really say who the man is. It just says, you know, one of them. Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest. So do we quit here and go, well, it just doesn't say who it is. Or do we buy the truth and sell it not? How do you buy the truth? You buy it with your time. 2 Timothy 2.15, we've already said that. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Okay, we're studying. We've got to keep going. Is this story mentioned anywhere else? Turn to Mark. We did Matthew. Turn to Mark, verse 14.42. Chapter 14, verse 42. Rise up. Rise up. Let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand, and immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, with him a great multitude with swords and staves. From the chief priests and the scribes and elders, and he that betrayed him had given him a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And here we go, verse 47. And one of them stood by, drew their sword, and smote a servant on the high priest and cut off his ear. Whew. Cut off his ear. Whoever this person is, they're, they're trying to be bold. They're trying to stick out. I mean, you got a huge multitude coming with staves and, and swords. And you had, I think, the 11 apostles, maybe not all of them, but 11 apostles and Jesus. But this man who's doing this, I mean, he's trying to be brave. He's trying to, I'm going to fight for Jesus. He lops out that person. It says, one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant on the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. But the scriptures, as we're going to get through here, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. This is our second time getting through here. It didn't say who it was. It just said, and one of them. So we quit here, right? We're just going to quit. We're just going to quit. No, if you want the truth, you buy the truth and you sell it not. You buy the truth with your time. It takes work. It takes time to study. So, is this story mentioned anywhere else in the Bible? Turn to Luke 22, 47. Luke 22, 47. And while he yet spake, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them. And drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, portray thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Brothers says Christ, you're going to have a lot of people in your life that are going to be nice to you. And you think just because they're being nice to you, they're your friend. They're, just because someone's nice to you doesn't mean they're a friend. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. That's what you used to do. You'd kiss men on the cheek. I'm your friend. Okay. And everybody that's dumping on you, like telling you where you're wrong or telling you you need to clean that up and you need to get that out of your life and you do that and they're dumping on you doesn't mean they hate you. Okay. Verse 49. When they which are about him saw that would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? We might find out. Is this where we're going to find out who that person is? Verse 50. And one of them, one of them, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Doesn't say. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. The servant of the high priest healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and of the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour. This is your hour and the power of darkness. 
Why did he say that? Well, we just read in the other two, one of the other two where it talked about it's, it's written. This has got to happen because it's prophesied. It's God's will. That's why Jesus had to be taken. It was God's will. Put away your sword. Whoever it was that was lopping off at the sword, put away your sword. Okay? This is the will of my Father. This is God's will. 54, Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Hmm. But it still said only one of them, only one of them was going gung-ho, pulled out his sword, and lopped off the ear. Okay. Now, this is where I keep preaching this, like, uh, Timothy 2.15. At this point, this is three times we had to look it up in the Bible, and three times it didn't tell us who it was. So we quit, right? 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You compare Scripture with Scripture. Three accounts in the Gospels, and it doesn't tell us who it is. But we got a little bit of a hint there. Okay. Proverbs 23.23, when I keep preaching this one, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. If you want to know the truth, brothers and sisters in Christ, you can't give up. You can't give up. Uh, one of the channels that I uh, support greatly is 33rd Book. Okay, I'll link his channel below. He does a teaching about cherubs. This, what we're doing here is going to be cake compared to what he did with cherubs. And he goes through, and boy, you have to go through the Bible, and go through the Bible, and go through the Bible, and it's an amazing teaching he does. I don't know why his channel doesn't get enough views from the brethren. Um, but it's a great teaching, and he goes through, and you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. You can't just look up the word cherub. You've got to look up different words. And it takes time. It's going to take your time. You've got to study. So... I, don't, I mean, this is three times. I mean, come on, it's told three times. Is it going to be mentioned again in the Bible? Well, yes, it is mentioned. This, story's whole, this whole story is mentioned again in the Bible. Turn to the book of John. John 18, 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, Knew, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted there with his disciples. Judas then, receiving a band, a good group of people, of men, and officers from the chief priests of the Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. See, now they're in lanterns, torches, and weapons. But remember, we know what the weapons are. When you compare scripture with scripture, they came with staves, and swords, a staff, staves of staffs, you know, like a shepherd's staff, and swords. Mm -hmm. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. Let's say, yeah. As soon as as, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell on the ground. Now there's all kinds of teachings people do, but the important part of this is this, for this teaching. If Jesus didn't want to be taken, they couldn't take him. Think about it. I am he. Come take me. I am he. They fall backwards onto the ground. Then asked, then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that they saying that the same might be fulfilled which was spoken of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Jesus had to be taken because he wanted to be taken. It was God's will. He has a plan. Remember that when we're doing this study. God has a plan. They could not have taken Jesus without his permission. Okay. Now here we go. Verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. We got it. Brother, sister Christ, we, we studied, we kept going, we didn't quit. We just found out who drew the sword. It was Simon Peter. Having a sword, drew, drew it and smote the high priest's servant 
and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Mal Malchus. We got more information. We got the servant's name and who it was. And we got told it was Peter. You mean Peter, the same man that when he was walking out on the water, he failed the Lord? When Jesus was walking on the water, G Peter's trying to be bold. He's always trying to be bold. I mean, Peter's a fisherman. That's another example of why he got the ear and didn't actually get the guy. <laughs> you know, He's not a warrior. He's not a soldier. He's a fisherman. He lops off the ear. But this is Peter. He was the one that said, Lord, if it be you, call me to walk out on the water with you. And he gets out on the water and he starts walking and he takes his eyes off of Jesus and looks at the world. The water, but the world. And starts fearing and not trusting Jesus. He failed to trust Jesus. He starts sinking. Lord, save me! And within a second, Jesus had his hand on him and they were in the boat. You mean this is the same Jesus, uh, Jesus. this is the same Peter that when Jesus told him about his death and how they were going to take him, he rebuked him. And Jesus looked at him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest the things that be of men and not the things that be of God. Peter had failed the Lord twice now. Twice he's failed the Lord big time in front of everybody. He's got to prove himself. I've got to prove myself. And we find out later that did he fail the Lord a third time. He ends up denying the Lord three times. He failed the Lord three times when it came to trusting him. It's just that simple, brothers and sisters Christ. But this is Peter, Simon Peter. We've, we've got the name. Verse 11, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink of it? It's prophecy. It's God's will. This is what God wants. If it wasn't, remember, they fell backwards. Jesus said time and time again, If I wanted, I could have a thousand angels at my side, ready to fight for me. You read in the Old Testament how one angel, I forgot how much it was, it was like 180,000 men or something like that, just wiped out. I can have a whole legion of angels to protect me. He says, The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Now remember, the eleven scattered and ran. John 18.25 says, And Simon Peter stood and warmed to himself. There said, they said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? This is when he's denying Jesus three times. He denied it and said, I am not. Verse 26, And one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter took off. He was there, and it was at night time, so it, it might have been him. It might, I mean, uh, it's not as bright as we have today. They didn't have lights. They had torches and lanterns. Said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. This is Peter we're talking about. This is, I'm gung-ho, I'm gung-ho. Now, the point I want to make here is, is Jesus kept saying, put away your sword. This is God's will. You have a sword to defend yourself, protect yourself. Okay? But there's some things in this world that's God's will. We've got to remember that. They could not have taken them without God's permission. Say, so what's the whole point of this study? We're going to get to it here, okay? This is Peter before the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus, or this is Peter before Jesus ascends up into glory. Okay? This is Peter before Pen, uh, Pentecost, before he gets the Holy Spirit. Okay? What's Peter's attitude after he gets the Holy Spirit? After God, has, Jesus, God manifests in the flesh, teaches him some things. He gives him a chance to, he forgives him and gives him a chance to, hey, now go do the work of the Lord. Is this how you do the work of the Lord? No. How do you do the work of the Lord? Turn to Acts chapter 5, verse 16. Okay. There came also a multitude out of the city. Let me lay this down. Out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk 
and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one of them. Then the high priest rose up, and all they were with them, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in, in the common prison. No, 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 no. Paul. What are you doing, Paul? You're supposed to be out there lobbing ears off. Is Paul out there lobbing ears off? No, there's a difference. There's a difference in Paul now. He's realizing that going out and mm, mm, isn't the answer. It's not the answer. They could not have put him in prison without God's permission. Let's keep reading. Put him in the common prison. Why didn't Paul fight? Why didn't the other apostles just go, we're going to go down, you're not putting us in prison, we're going to go down guns blazing. Why didn't they have that attitude? Because they couldn't have done it without God's permission. Verse 19, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, okay. Before we keep going, I'm going to stop there for a second. Said, now I don't you have to turn here, but I want to read these other verses real quick. Luke 3, 7 says, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized to him, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. I was forgot to do that. I was supposed to go... Instead of them going, they're supposed to flee. When they go to grab you and everything, you're supposed to flee from the wrath to come. You're supposed to read, flee from the wrath to come. Flee, save your lives, and be like the be like the heath in the wilderness. Mountains and rocks fall on us, hide us. Urgh. Is that how Paul and them are supposed to be? You say you sound like a rambling, <laughs> a rambling fool. Yes, I would. You can make the Bible say anything. Jeremiah 46, 8, uh, 48, 6 says, Flee, save your lives, and be like the heath in the wilderness. Revelation 16, if you knew that comment, where it says, Mountains and rocks fall on us, hide us. They're coming to get us, Lord. We, we either got to fight or we got to run ah, and go crazy. No. They stood firm. We're doing the work of the Lord, and we're not going to stop doing the work of the Lord. Even if that means being put in prison. Okay. One of the biggest things I'm hearing among the brethren lately, brothers and sisters of Christ, is people saying, oh, I'm going to go down guns blazing with what's going on out there. They come to my door, I'm going down guns blazing. Was that Peter's attitude? We're going to read a little bit about Paul. Was that Paul's attitude? James? Stephen? Right? No. Be very careful, brothers and sisters of Christ, if Paul and those 11 disciples, we're going to keep going, because it says, bring them forth. They're, they're going to get a chance to talk. We're going to keep reading this whole story. But if they would have went in there, guns blazing, as, as we say today, with the sword out, and we're going to hack here, they would have died. That's it. Can't be used to the Lord anymore. Oh well. Evidently, God can't protect you. You've got to try to protect yourself. And I'm talking about against, this is against religious leaders. There's mobs that we're going to be talking about. The leaders of the day. God can protect you. Look what he did. He got him, broke him out of prison. And what did he tell him? Acts 5.20. Keep going. Go, stand, speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. He didn't tell them, flee. Flee from the wrath to come. I just broke you out. Run. You know, flee, flee, save your lives, and be like the heath in the wilderness. Run! Hide in the wilderness. That's not what he said. He said, get back to the work of the Lord. Get back to abounding in the work of the Lord. Go back to doing what you're doing. These, I'm in charge. God's like, I'm in charge, not these people. Be of good cheer. I'm watching over you. I'm protecting you. Be of good cheer. Go back and stand in the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, and returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found, found we shut with all safety. Let that sink in. Okay. I don't know how to explain it. I'm not going to be a person that says, I'm going to tell you how God did it. Because then he wouldn't be God. But what they're saying happened, I'm going to tell you what happened. Jesus opened up everything to the disciples and they left. 
And when the other people came back, it was back the way it was before Jesus broke them out. Everything was locked shut, tight as can be, as if nothing happened. It was as if the apostles were never there in prison. You know, know what uh, Paul says, uh, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. No, he's a prisoner of the Rome. No, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's there because Jesus wants him there. They were thrown in prison and Jesus is like, I, I don't want them in prison. I want you back out there doing the work of the Lord, doing my work. Verse 24, Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then when the captain with the officers had brought them without violence, for they feared the people. I think part of this also helped out with how they treated the apostles. At first they just threw them in like they're nothing. Then when they saw, wait a minute, how did this happen? They were in prison and now they're back out there. And the people are even, they're swaying the people to believe in Jesus Christ. They're swaying the people and now they're going to have to, they're fearing the people. For they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they said, set them before the council and the high priest asked them, saying, a lot of pages, <laughs> did we straightly, did we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us? Jesus Christ. They're guilty. The Jews are guilty. The Romans are guilty. Jews and Gentiles are guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. But notice he said that it happened before. It's happened before? Probably wants to grab the sword again. Uh-oh, Peter. What happened? They, you got arrested before and you didn't fight and hack people's ears off? What's going on? Peter realizes there's more going on. God has a plan. We're not supposed to be that way. He was like that before, but now he's like, I will stand my ground, and if it means that they kill me, then that means they kill me, but I'm going to stand my ground. That's how we fight for the Lord. We stand for His Word and we continue to abound in the work of the Lord. That's how you fight for Jesus Christ. Running out there, guns blazing, Peter had to learn that's not how you fight for Jesus Christ. Okay. Turn to Acts. Remember, we're going to come back to the story and finish it, but go back to Acts chapter 4. They just said there that, didn't we command you that you should not teach in this name? In other words, Peter got arrested before. Hmm. Let's read about that. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the certain of the, of the I'm sorry, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Because remember, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. Pharisees do, but the Sadducees don't. So they're grieved that he's teaching the resurrection. Verse 3, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. I'm going to do it anyway. What? Peter? This is we're, We started out the second time thinking that was the first time. No, you compare Scripture with Scripture. You mean Peter was arrested before and he didn't lob people's ears off? What's going on, Peter? You, what, what happened to that man in the garden that lobbed that priest's ear off? that was willing to stand up and fight and kill for Jesus Christ and, and everything. See, what you did is you had a man that was willing to fight and kill for Jesus Christ. What are we seeing here? We saw a change in Peter. Now you have a man that's willing to die for Jesus Christ. Not kill for him. Die for him. No matter what the cost. I will stand for Jesus Christ and I will preach his word. Verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. You mean Peter, he goes to prison, and then afterwards you keep reading, he leads more people to the Lord? And then he goes to prison that time that we're reading right now? Hmm. There's also a time, we're going to get to it, I don't know if I did, but mainly this is about Peter. But I remember Paul getting arrested sometimes too. 
And there was one time where Paul, I think it was Paul, that got arrested, and I might be getting ahead of myself, where the, the, the Lord opened all the, the doors and everything with an earthquake, opened it up, and when the captain woke up, the guard, he went and looked and was about to kill himself. And Peter's like, I think it's Paul, says, we're still here. We're still here. Don't kill yourself, we're still here. And he led that man to Christ. How could he lead that man to Christ if he would have went down guns blazing? I'm going to pull out my sword and hack off ears. Couldn't. We see people getting saved. They get thrown in prison and they get released. Now, not everybody gets released. We're going to go through this. There's sometimes God, the prophecy is that there are brethren that are going to die, martyrs, that will die for Jesus Christ. Sometimes you are going to die. But we're going to look at those martyrs real quick as we go through here to see, did they fight back, guns blazing? Or did they stand firm to the Word of God with love, truth, peace? They went to their death peacefully because they had true peace, God's peace in them. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Ananias the high priest, we know about Ananias, and Cephas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Now I'm stopping here to say this. Brothers and sisters Christ, I'm not saying that you just roll over and just go, Well, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to say anything, and they can do whatever they want to me. Oh no. You'll see here that they stand up to them and they preach truth. You stand for the truth and you preach the truth. You be a light to this world. The point is, is we don't live by the sword. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Pardon me, I almost wanted to be like, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, start going around and whacking the ears off, right? No, that's not what Peter did. What did he do? Being filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the, impo the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, they did a miracle, be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, of whom, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and he starts telling them about Jesus Christ. He's not filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm going to grab a sword and go start lobbing off ears. He's not filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm going to grab my guns and I'm going to go down guns blazing. He preaches Jesus Christ. This is the stone which was set at the knot of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Remember, Jesus is our foundation. He's also the head of the corner. Starts with Jesus, ends with Jesus. That's the life of a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. Through his word, it starts with Jesus, it ends with Jesus. Verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. That's a memory verse. Paul is preaching salvation to him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's been taken in prisoner, and instead of saying, I'm going to fight my way out with a sword, he's preaching truth. Whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, boldness. These are, this is Ananias, the high priest. Don't you remember him with Jesus? Yeah. He's bold. He's got the Holy Spirit in him and he's speaking boldly. I'm not saying you have to be a coward. I'm just saying you stand firm for the word of God, you, what's going on out here in the world today. You stand firm. You stand to absolute truth. You stand your ground. But we are not to live by the sword. Saw the bones of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. Because remember, Peter's a fisherman. He couldn't even hit the person properly, and they only got an ear. He doesn't know how to use a sword. He's not a warrior. He's not a scholar. He's a fisherman. They saw the bones of Peter and John, and perceived that these were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man that they had been with Jesus, you mean there was evidence? We're supposed to be a light to the world. There's supposed to be a changed life after salvation. So people look at you and go, wow, Jesus has really touched that person. 
You re he really saved you. Amen. He really saved me. If you'd have saw me before I got saved, you would have looked. You wouldn't have seen Jesus at all. That person, oh, he doesn't know Jesus. I was a professing Christian. I like to call myself a Christian, but I was no Christian. Verse 14, In beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all them that dwelt in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightway threaten them, threaten them, kind of like what we're being done today, we're being threatened today, left and right, by the pandemic. Threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak out or at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, those Peter's, like I said, you're not supposed to bow down like a coward and go, yes, sir, yes, sir. Did Peter go, yes, sir, yes, sir? No. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. They Iran will read about how it's, we ought to obey God rather than men. In other words, they're saying they're going to do what God tells them to do over what they tell them to do. God has pro a final authority. That's why we always keep teaching this book here is the final authority. God is the final authority, not me. Not whatever man that you're following and watching on YouTube. Not ever in any of those hirelings behind the pulpit, chapter, verse, and pulpit, um, and the Bible building systems. They're not the final authority. The uh, religious scholars that bring out these Bible perversions left and right, they're not the final authority. God and His perfect written word, the King James Bible, is the final authority. Verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them and let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for which was done. See, God protected them. God allowed them to do that miracle that protected them. And those people, that people that got saved, that wanted to get saved, you've got a bunch of the people that were on the side of Jesus, they were on uh, Paul and John's side, they had that miracle that was done. God had everything set up perfectly to protect them. Which was done, verse 22, For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, we get bitter. When they heard that, we get angry. We get bitter. We get hateful. We gotta start mocking people. We gotta start yelling at people and, and calling them names and making fun of them and everything. Is that what they did? Let's see what they did. Let's keep reading. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to, for to do whatever they, thy hand and thy counsel determined for to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By, stretch forth thine, by stretching forth thine hands to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken with their let's see, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Another time they prayed, we're getting to the point where they praised God. So what did they do? They were threatened. Lord, Brother says Christ, we're being threatened by this world today. There's always something out there threatening the body of Christ. If it wasn't this pandemic, it'd be something else. There's always been something out there threatening the body of Christ. What do we do? When anytime we suffer for Jesus Christ and His name's sake, we give God glory. We praise the Lord. 
And when we're, gonna, we're getting threatened, like we are now, where they could come into this home right now, we pray for God's protection. We pray that the Lord distracts them from the body of Christ. Let the lost world just fight each other and devour each other. This lost world that's just rejected Jesus Christ left and left, right. While that's going on and they're devouring one another, people might start waking up, and they have. People will start waking up. People are more open to the truth. So the seeds that have been planted, you can be the one to water that seed, and someone gets saved and born again. But we're not supposed to have bad attitudes. We're not supposed to hold grudges. We're not supposed to be, even to, when it comes to the enemy, these guys were enemies. We saw the list. The, that's like public, when it comes to Bible believers, those are public enemies. Public enemy number one, you know. But they're praying that they can speak boldly, continue doing the work of the Lord. That God will protect them. Go back to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Back to the second time they were arrested. And they just got told, did we not tell you not to preach in this name? This is the second time. And like I said, I, I can keep grabbing this to make my point, because I really want to drive this home, brothers and sisters. Where is Peter hacking off ears? He did before. Why isn't he doing it now? He's hacking off ears before. I'm willing to kill for you, Lord. But then it got to the point where Jesus said, feed my sheep, because he denied him three times. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. I hope I got that right. But three times, he's like, that's how you fight for me. By living for me. I've always pushed this, brother and sister Christ. I've always pushed this. To live, the Bible says, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Why is that? Because as we're, God's the one that decides whether it's time to come home or not. He's the one that decides whether you die or not. God does. So until that happens, we're to live for Jesus Christ. You know there was a time where people would live for Jesus Christ, but they had a hard time dying for Jesus Christ? You had people that would, would recant, with the Catholicism would come through and take the... Uh, would take people that believe in Jesus Christ and His Word, because they, they got away, they, they denounced Catholicism, but then they got scared, they didn't want to die, and they would recant, and then later they would recant of their recanting and everything, and just... They had a hard time. They had a fear of dying for Jesus Christ. What I see going on today, brothers and sisters Christ, in these last days, I see brethren that are so quick and eager and willing to die for Jesus Christ because they see it harder living for Jesus Christ in these last days. It's easier to die for Jesus Christ than it is to live for Jesus Christ. And I, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that's wrong because. There are some people in certain countries, brethren out there in different countries, where when they're trying so hard to live for Jesus Christ, and it just seems so hard. They seem, I can see how they could say, it'd be easier just to die for Jesus Christ. But that's the problem I see today. Everybody's so quick to grab the sword and say, I'll die for Jesus Christ. But how many of you are living for Jesus Christ? How many of you are abounding in the work of the Lord? How many of the men in ministry are still standing? Still fighting for the Lord through preaching. That's how Paul just fought for the Lord the first time he was arrested. He preached truth. How many are still standing and preaching truth? Or are they getting so distracted by what's going on in the world? If it wasn't for this pandemic, it'd be something else. These Babel buildings, these uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, false converts out there. Okay? I'm just saying, brothers and sisters Christ, we need to live for Jesus Christ. That's what Paul had to learn. Feed my sheep. You need to abound in the work of the Lord. You need to live for me. That's how you fight for me. You need to be a light to this dark world. That's how you fight for me. Not with the sword. Not with guns. Acts chapter 5, 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, remember, they were just told, didn't we tell you not to preach? Didn't we tell you to stop preaching about the resurrection and Jesus Christ, the gospel. Then Peter and the, other, and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Here they are in prison again. And they're saying, I'm sorry, I have to obey God. They come to my door and try to give me the experimental gene therapy death shot. Sorry, I ought to obey God rather than man. I'm not taking that shot. Well, if you don't take the shot, you're going to have to go to a uh, quarantine camp. I'm grabbing my Bible. 
they're going to make you go regardless. I'm going to grab my Bible and say, Lord, they wouldn't be able to come to my door with all these men and with all these guns. They would not be able to take me away if you didn't give them permission. And that's what you wanted. You evidently want me in those uh, quarantine camps to preach your word and continue to abound in the work of the Lord. It might get bad. I'm getting ahead of myself. But you get when we read about James, it's going to be a long study. I apologize, brothers and sisters in Christ. But it might get bad enough where they don't give you an opportunity. Take the shot. And we're like, I ain't taking this shot. And they shoot you. Just shoot you right then and there. Oh, he tried to fight us, so we had to shoot him and kill him. And God allowed it to happen. Okay? It's God's will. But we ought to obey God rather than man. He just stands up to him and preaches truth to him. Verse 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And, and we are his witnesses of these things. That's one of the marks of a fall, of a, um, apostle, is they've actually physically seen Jesus Christ. To anybody says they're apostle today, they're a fake and a fraud. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. If I have to die, I'm going to die. But I'm going to die preaching the truth. I'm not going to die because I'm trying to attack someone's year off and I get, I get killed because of it. No, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die because I'm preaching the truth. They took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named um, Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among the people, so God raised somebody up that had reputation. In other words, there was a little fear for him. They feared him a little bit. And commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For because these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain. And all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this, man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Verse 3, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel be the work of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Think about that. Uh, the scriptures, when we read about Paul, uh, Peter, when he first grabbed his sword to lop off ears, I hope I've been saying Peter, sometimes I keep slipping up and saying Paul, Peter, Paul, P, 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 P both P's. Peter, Lock off the ear. Remember we said let these these people go their way because the scriptures were fulfilled. Uh, my, he, hadn't, he didn't lose any of his apostles. The scriptures were him. But if it be of God. Peter, first time they were arrested, got out. And there's stories of, 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 of Paul when he was arrested that God protected him and watched over him. If this work be of men, or but if this be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you be found even to fight against God. And that's my verse for what's going on out there today, brothers and sisters Christ. God is bringing that apart, uh, bringing that uh, about. God's wrath and God's judgment's on this nation, it's on every nation. God's bringing everything about. The catching away of the body of Christ is coming. It's coming. And if you're not looking for it with the life that you're living, you're going to be caught by surprise big time. I don't know when it's going to happen, so I'm going to be surprised too. But I'm talking about you're going to be caught big time surprised because you're going to be on a falling flat on your face and not in a standing position because you're not looking for Jesus Christ to come back every day with the life that you're living. Okay? But we look out there and people are like, we need to get swords, we need to get guns, we need to do an army, we need to fight, fight, fight. Are you going to fight against God? He's the one allowing all this to come about. Are you going to fight against God? And with what army? Okay. Some people have been, it's one of the movies I do like, and it's called Oliver Cromwell, um, and it's based off a true story, but I think some people have been watching that movie too much. Okay, It's not the same situation as today as it was back then with them. Most of the country were Bible-believing, God-fearing men, and they had a king that betrayed them to Catholicism. 
today, I, I'm, I'd be nice and say 10% of Americans. I'm just going off the American population, not the world. But 10% of Americans are saved, but only 4% of that 10% is still in a standing position. The Bible says in these last days there shall be a falling away first. I've seen great men of God fall away. Okay, I've seen them. I've seen great men of God get messed up. But there's like 4%, let's say 4% of the American population, and that's still way too high, I think. But they're saved. That's not enough. It's not the same situation as Oliver Cromwell. This nation is not God-fearing. It's God-hating. This nation as a whole hates the real Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate the real capital G God. They hate Him. It's not the same situation. What's going on out there it says, But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Well, we're going to go over and we're going to stop this whole stuff from happening by force with swords and, well, today's guns. You're going to overthrow what God's doing. You're going to fight against God. He's bringing this about. He's allowing this to happen. He wants it to happen. A judgment on this nation. It's judgment on all the other nations. He's bringing about the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. He's letting all the pieces get into place. Verse 40, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They beat them. They could come to my door and knock on my door and take me to a... Uh, uh, they want to call it a concentration camp, but that's not what it was called. Uh, Brother in Christ showed me some pictures, and I don't know what I did with them, so you're going to have to look up online if they're still there. Um, but there were some pictures back in the World War II, uh, Germany, Nazi Germany, where they had signs where it said detention camp, uh, not detention, um, quarantine camps. They were called quarantine camps all through the Holocaust. Those Jews, there's something wrong with them. We've got to quarantine them. There's some, they're just, there's something wrong with them. We got to quarantine them. Oh, you're a German and you sympathize with the Jews. Now you've got the same sickness, and we need to quarantine you. See how that works? It was quarantine camps. They come to my door and they send me to a quarantine camp and beat me like here where they sign my beat. They, whatever they try to do to me, it's not going to stop me from preaching truth. It's not going to stop me from preaching absolute truth. Let's look at what Paul's attitude was. And they departed from the presence of the council, this is after they were beaten, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Some of the brethren in ministry out there have forgotten that. They still make snide remarks towards the lost world. Uh, mocking, um, cutting up videos and stuff like that. Um, that's not how we're supposed to act. When someone has persecuted you, made fun of your ministry, which is God's ministry, they're actually making fun of Jesus, they're making fun of God. It's God's ministry, it's not my ministry. He just blessed me with being in it. It's Paul said that this is my ministry, and Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. And he said, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. See, I'm doing my best to follow God's words, to follow Paul and follow Jesus, because Paul was the apostle that Jesus himself appointed to the Gentiles. This is God's ministry. So when they come down on me and they've made fun of me, they've made videos attacking me, they've called me names, you praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, to count me worthy to suffer for your name's sake. Praise the Lord. But some of the brethren have forgot that, and instead of having joy... And praising God, they're starting to get bitterness to build up in their heart. They start getting pride. They start having hate. That's not how we're supposed to be. Paul did not sit here and just start going off on those people that arrested him. Start calling them names and, and everything. No. What did he do? He started praising God. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. We ought to obey God rather than man. They continued to abound in the work of the Lord. They didn't go crazy, swords, you know, they didn't go crazy with swords. I'm going to go crazy like this. They didn't do that. You know what they said? We're going to go crazy with this. Brothers and sisters of Christ, that's how we're supposed to be today. We're supposed to go crazy with this. 
Paul was not courageous. He thought he was when he grabbed that sword and, and cut off that person's ear. Now he is courageous. He's getting arrested for Jesus Christ. He's getting beaten for Jesus Christ. And if he has to, he's willing to die for Jesus Christ. But until that day comes, he's going to continue living for Jesus Christ and being bold for Jesus Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 12, verse 1. This is a third time that Peter gets called into prison. Acts 12, 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Here it is, too. We're going to talk about him again later, but two. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Oh, come on, James. How... Why didn't you go down fighting, James? Come on, we're supposed to fight, right? No. I preach the truth. Here I am. I'm preaching truth. If you're going to kill me for it, kill me for it. And they killed James, the brother of John. They also, uh, John with the sword, verse 3, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, Herod was a people pleaser. Who else was a people pleaser in the Old Testament? Saul was more worried about the people and pleasing the people. He saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the leavened bread. Okay? That if it's the days of unleavened bread, there is no Passover. Passover already came. Because you have Passover, and then the days of unleavened bread are after Passover. Okay? But Peter, this is the third time that you get arrested. Why weren't you pulling out your sword and lobbing off ears? Peter, come on now. we got to fight. Those brethren out there that are getting a little out of control, I'm going to fight, I'm going to die, I'm going to go down guns blazing. Peter? Why weren't you out there lobbing off the ears? Because people, Peter learned, our battle is not physical, it's spiritual. We're here to win souls for Jesus Christ, to be a light to this dark world. And if you go down swinging and get killed, how can you be a light to this world? You can't? How do you? You know, it's up to God. Like I said, when I die, it's God. God's the one that decides. But they took people also, then were the days of the leaven, bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four cordions. I hope I'm saying that right. Of soldiers to keep him. It's a lot of soldiers. Intending after Easter. See, that's the right reading. So there's people who will attack that reading saying it's not supposed to be Easter. It should be Passover. He was going to hold Peter for another year. It's a whole other study. But right there we saw it was the days of unleavened bread. Passover already came and went. No, it was Easter. Okay? And taking after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Brother and sister Christ, you know what we can do? You know how you can fight this that's going on out there? Pray for one another. Pray for the brethren. I mean, even if it wasn't for this pandemic, brothers and sisters of Christ, there's always something that we're always worried about getting shut down online. Our ministry getting shut down. Online ministry. We can't email brethren. We can't talk with brethren. All you can do is pray that you have brethren in your area that you can come together and continue to still worship the Lord and do the work of the Lord. We're always saying that this could happen. What we need is you to pray for us. That doesn't change. It's not just for ministries. It's for the brethren as a whole. No matter what's going on out there, and I'm pointing outside, there's a window over there. It doesn't matter what's going on out there in the world. You pray. That's the way you fight, is through prayer. Mm -hmm. They were praying for Peter. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Between two so They really didn't want him going nowhere. They heard stories about Peter. They didn't want him going nowhere. Remember the story, the uh, uh, first time they were arrested? They uh, got broke out. God broke him out of prison and told him to get back to preaching the word of the Lord. He didn't just break him out of the prison, just tell him, hey, you can run, you can hide, you can flee, you can start fading away. No, get back to doing the work of the Lord. But they remember that story. Boy, they didn't want Peter going anywhere. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made. Okay, verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains... And the keepers before the door kept the prison. 
And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And when he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought it, he saw a vision, maybe he's dreaming, I, I might be dreaming, I, this is just too good to be true, it's just, uh, maybe I'm dreaming. Verse 10, when they were past the first and the second ward, the first and second ward, boy, they had to go, they really had him in the prison. They came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hands of Herod, and from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. What do we get from this, brothers and sisters Christ? A, they could not have, Herod could not have arrested Peter without God's permission. He couldn't. And then God goes, okay, Herod's going to kill Peter. Well, I'm not done with Peter yet. James, he did his course. Praise the Lord, James. You did a great job. And it's time for you to come home. Remember, they killed James, the brother John, and they went to grab Peter also. But Peter's like, I'm not done with Peter yet. I still have some work for you. I'm not done with you. We gotta keep going. Gotta keep going. Um, and God broke Peter out of prison. He didn't break Peter out of prison, so he could go back to hiding. Okay, now go into hiding. No, he broke him out of, out of uh, prison, so he can get back to doing the work of the Lord. And if you keep reading the story, the, I think it's this one that the guards, when Herod found out that Peter wasn't there, he had the guards killed. And when you get to the story about Paul, when he's arrested, and the guard's about to kill himself, why is he going to kill himself? Because if all the prisoners are gone, that's, they're going to kill him. That's his punishment for not making sure the prisoners were stayed under guard. Okay, it's a serious thing. Ephesians 6.12 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our battle is spiritual, brothers and sisters in Christ. If God doesn't want us taken out of our homes, we won't be taken out of our homes. If God wants us taken out of our homes and put in quarantine camps, then He's going to take us out of our homes and put us in quarantine camps. It's God's will. His will. We're supposed to pray. That's one of our prayers. We're supposed to pray God's will be done. I do that all the time. I ask God, I said, Lord, this is what I want to do today. If, if it be your will. If it be your will, Lord. And if it doesn't happen, either I got in the way, or it wasn't God's will. Because there's times where I don't get everything done because of me, I start procrastinating sometimes. But the point is, is you know, I always say, if it be your will, can I do this? If it be your will, can I do that, Lord? Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. His purpose. Now, I'm sorry this is a long study, but i still got some more. Hopefully you guys can pause it if you want to and come back. But the main part is done. Peter. Okay? All things work together for good to them that trust God, to them that, to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Do you love God? Oh, well, yeah. Then trust Him. Trust Him. He knows what He's doing. By all means, fight what's going on out there with your words. But you do it through this. Through it by preaching truth. Okay? Get back to the major doctrines. Get back to instruction and righteousness. Get back to the plan of salvation. Get back to the Bible version issue. Get back to preaching absolute truth. That's how you fight what's going on out there. Getting distracted by what's going on out in the world and starting to get to the point where some of, like I said, some of the brethren I've been hearing and making comments under uh, different brethren's channels, and it's like, Getting out there with a gun and fighting to the death, that's not the answer. It's not the answer. You're not going to solve anything. You're going to be fighting against God. Now John 16, 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. We saw that with James. Oh, not James. 
Uh, Herod thought, saw that it pleased the Jews, but the Jews were doing, thinking they were doing God's service. This man's a heretic. He needs to be put to death. Was there somebody else that was put to death? Turn to Acts chapter 7, verse 51. It says here, Ye stiff-necked, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your Father did, so do ye. That's what we're seeing today. They're all resisting the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is out there to convict the world of sin. That's why the Bible says God's laws are written in every man's heart. Verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who having received the law by the disposition of the angels and have not kept it, when they heard these things, I'm sorry, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So whoever this man is, he's really pointing at him. I kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That's what we're supposed to do, brother. This is the second time we heard this. They were cut to the heart. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to preach absolute truth and cut people to the heart. Cut this world to the heart. That's how you fight. With words, cutting people to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to hear this. They, were, they are rejecting the whole, what does it say up here? Um, resist the Holy Ghost. They don't want to hear it. They stopped their ears. And ran up upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Who's that young man? Whose surname was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. They stoned him. Calling upon God and saying, Lord... And they stoned Stephen, and this is Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. No, no, no. He was supposed to say, avenge my death. Kill these people. Give me strength so I can grab my sword and start lobbing some ears off. No, what did he say? Receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud vo voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You know, you have Saul sitting there who was deceived because he saw, talked about before when Saul later becomes Paul, he talks about before he did it in unbelief. You have certain people out there, brother and sister in Christ, that are wolves in sheep's clothing that are deceiving people. And those people that are deceived, we need to do our best to reach them. We're not, in these last days, are we going to hardly reach them? I don't know. That's between God and them. But we're supposed to preach truth because we, I understand there's certain leaders that are going to lead people astray. And I believe that's what Stephen felt. He's like, some of these people here were starting to listen to me, and some of these people were starting to get, they're on the verge of getting saved, and then you had the religious leaders of the day come in and ruin it. Someone else might come along. If, if, if he would said, kill them all, Lord, they'd go to hell. But I believe Stephen realized that, hey, there's some of them that might still get saved. Lord, please lay this not to their charge. Give them as, I always pray that. Give them as many opportunities to get saved as possible. But once again, you see Stephen. He's not having that attitude of we need to go down guns blazing and waving his sword around so that they'll shoot arrows at him or stab him or kill him. In other words, they don't come quietly so they get killed in the process of them trying to take him away. Uh, James, we read about James in Acts 12.1. It says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Those are the two people we actually read about in Scripture that actually were martyrs that died for Jesus Christ. We get told how Peter died, but it doesn't really say it. We get told how Paul died, but it doesn't really say it. We know Paul wrote his letter saying, My time is about to up. My time's coming. He's going to be put to death. My time's almost up. When he's reading a I think he's writing to Timothy when he says that. My time's almost up. You know, 
that's there. But these are the two instances where we actually see people who actually die for Jesus Christ. Did they raise a sword to fight back? I'm going to fight to the death. No. Brothers and Christ, I've been watching like church history um, uh, called uh, Martyrs. And all these different stories about when this book came popular in the sense that it started going all over the world. And you had missionaries going all over the world and you listened to their stories and their testimonies and some of them died. Some of them had uh, hard times where they went through serious hard times. But they didn't take this book with, they didn't take this and this. Okay? They took this and this. Jesus Christ in them, preaching the word, cutting the world to the heart. And you had people dying. And because of their deaths, people got saved. It was a testimony to the truth. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11.21. What about somebody, did somebody else die for the Lord? This is a great situation because there's someone who died for the Lord, but the Lord's like, eh, I'm not done with you yet. Once again, God's the one in charge. He's the one that says whether you die or not. And how many times you die. <laughs> okay. 2 Corinthians 11, 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit, whensoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. What's going on here is you got people boasting, I've, I, I got hit over the head with a little stick for the Lord. That makes me great. Oh, I stubbed my toe yesterday for the Lord, and, and it was great. It was hard, and I just, I should be praised. I'm being sarcastic, but, you know, you have people saying this, I went through this, I went through this, and instead of praising, like what did Peter do? He praised the Lord. Instead of praising the Lord and giving God glory and everything, God thanks and everything, they were saying, look at me. They are elevating themselves. Up. They wanted the praise of men. So Paul's going on, well, then I'll speak foolishly. He's not speaking this because this is how we're supposed to speak. He's saying I had to do this to put those people in their place. So I'll speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Because you had Hebrews coming in, I guess, that were, trying, that were acting that way, being bold, and like, it's me, look at me, worship me. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Question mark. I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. He was beaten a lot. Oh, come on, Paul, why didn't you grab out your sword and start lobbing off ears? He was beaten. In prisons, more frequent. He was thrown in prison a lot. No, no, we got to fight. we got to stand and fight, you know. I I'm going to go down guns blazing. And deaths oft. Deaths oft. You mean Paul died more than once? Just something to think about. Now, I want to stop there for a second. I understand for a single man like me, I can have more boldness. I want to say is I understand for the brethren out there that have wives, that have children, that are saved, and you worry for your wife and your child, but we still need to have the same attitude. And I, and I can understand how it's harder for you guys because you love them and you, you're, you're to protect them. But like I said, self-defense, protect them. But when the lost, God-hating world comes for us, we're not supposed to be living by the sword. Okay. We're not supposed to be living by the sword at all. Look at what Paul went through. Deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Five times. He was really, he's saying five times I was really whipped. You've never been through that. These people that were coming in saying, look at me, worship me, worship, look what I've done for God. Look what I've been through for God. He's putting them in their place. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I had been in the deep. Remember we talked about that in other studies when he was stoned. I believe he died and that's when he was able to tell us about that story of being caught up by the soul. The body stays behind because you die and you get caught up in the soul. And he tells us about that man. I, I knew a man once that whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell. It's because he got a glimpse of heaven. And then God's like, I'm not done with you. And he gave him that glimpse to let us, to give us hope. To live as Christ, to die as gain. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Dying for the Lord is, is a great thing. It is. 
when God, when, call, when God, I repeat, when God calls us to, not when we take it upon ourselves, when God calls us to. Verse 26, And journeyings often, and perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. Paul used to cry night and day with tears for three years because wolves in sheep's clothing were coming in and messing up everything he had done, all the work he had done for the Lord. They were messing people up. And he was crying night and day with tears for three years. Talking about being perils among false brethren. You have false brethren coming in and messing things up. That's what I meant by you have wolves in sheep's clothing that will come in and scatter the flock. Well, that wolf in sheep's clothing, I've, like, Paul got saved. Uh, yeah, Paul got saved who used to be Saul, but we need to be preaching to the sheep. We need to be preaching to the people that are getting scattered. We need to be preaching to the that are saved and scattered. Like I said, 6% that I believe are like, if there are that many people saved, out of the 10% of saved sinners today, 6% probably are not standing anymore. They're falling flat on their face. They're part of the falling away. Okay. Why? Because perils among false brethren. Wolves in sheep's clothing is what we're fighting today. It's a spiritual battle. And weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. We're supposed to praise God when we go through hard times for Him. Whatever state we're in, we're there with to be content. Financially, physically, we're to be content and give God glory and thanks in all things. We're not supposed to be offended. We're not supposed to be getting bent out of shape. We're not supposed to be having the attitude, I'm going to grab my sword and go to war, like a physical sword. This is the sword you grab and go to war. But you're not supposed to be grabbing your guns and everything and going crazy. If I need, must needs glory, I will glory of of the thing which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. And Damascus, the governor under Eretus, the king, kept the city of the Damasians with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window and a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. God said, I'm not done with you, I'm going to provide a way out. If God wants to still use you today, and He does, brothers and Christ, you're still breathing, aren't you? Then God wants to use you today. Keep abounding in the work of the Lord. He'll make a way out. If He's like, okay, you've done the work that I need you to do, it's time to come home, then it's time to come home. But that's God's decision, not ours. Okay? There's plenty of times Paul could have gone home to be with the Lord. We just read it there. Plenty of times. But God's like, I'm not done with you yet, Paul. I need you to keep doing the work of the Lord. Peter, he could have gone home to be with the Lord. I'm not done with you. James, yeah, it's time to come home. Stephen, yeah, it's time to come home. There's times he's going to say, yep, it's time to come home. And there's times where he's going to say, no. It's time for you to stay and continue to abound in the work of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's what Paul was talking about. It's like, I have a straight betwixt two. To be with the Lord is far better, but to be here is much needful for you. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That's why you're here. If you're still here, you're still breathing, and God hasn't brought you home yet, it's because there's work to be done. God wants you to do the work of the Lord. The brethren need you. They need your prayers. They need your help, whether it's physically or spiritually. If you're in ministry, they need you to continue preaching the Word of God. Standing firm. That's why you're still here. There are times when you will stand for Jesus and His Word and be killed. We talked about that. And there will be times where God will say no, say not now, and spare you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I apologize. I try not to do such long studies. But, brother, God really put it on my heart. We'll get back to our, our study about great is the mystery. And we're going through all the different ministries. Okay. But God put it on my heart to put this study out. Because I'm starting to hear brethren out there that are getting gung-ho. And they're trying to get rile up the other brethren to get physical. 
when that's not what God's talked once called us to do. We're supposed to be piercing people's heart with this sword. This is our weapon. And that's why it's so important, brothers and sisters of Christ, that you stay in this book, the King James Bible for English-speaking people. You stay in God's Word. You read God's Word. You need to know this book. You need to know this book. You need to hide it in your heart. Okay. This might get taken away, and you've got to have scriptures in your heart. Memorize scriptures and apply them to your life. This could get taken away. It's just a physical book. It's the words that matter. That's why you've got to hide them in your heart. I don't know how tough things will get, but I believe that we're supposed to look for Jesus to come back every day with the life that we're living. And you can always see the brethren out there that aren't looking for Jesus Christ. How? By the life that they're living. They're not living as strong as they used to. They're starting to slow down. They're starting to get weak. They're starting to fade out. They start going the way of the world. And we've had a great, we have this falling away. I almost want to say great, but the Bible says there shall be a falling away first. There's people falling away, brothers, is Christ. I keep praying with all my heart to the Lord that I don't want to be one of them. And that I keep standing for the Lord. And I pray that prayer for everybody that's standing. I also pray this prayer that maybe this pandemic that's going on out there is a way to wake the brethren up. The brethren that were, like, a couple years ago that were sleeping, they're not dead dead, because usually in the Bible sleeping is dead. I'm talking about they're just, they're, they're laying on the job. You ever heard that saying where they're sitting on the job and laying on the job? They're not standing at their post. They go and sit somewhere and lay down and start eating food and just goofing around and everything. That's what the Christians are doing. They're falling. And if this is what it takes to wake the brethren up, to get people to stand back up, those few of us that are left, to stand back up and do the work of the Lord and get back to getting our testimony back. You can lose your testimony. To get back to trying to get some more rewards. Get back to being there for the brethren. Praying for the brethren. Helping the brethren out. If that's what it takes, praise the Lord. We give God glory in everything, brothers and sisters of Christ. Everything. Okay? Please, please, brothers and sisters of Christ, remember what our weapon is. It's this. The Holy Spirit in us. Through His Word, we're piercing hearts. We're supposed to pierce people's hearts. And they can get angry enough to kill us. We read about it. They can get very angry enough to want to kill you, brothers and sisters of Christ. But if you're preaching truth, not calling them names, not belittling them, mocking them, having bitterness in your heart towards them or hate towards them. No, love, true love by preaching truth to them. God's word piercing their heart. They're going to get angry enough to hate you. And what do you do? You praise God for it. This is our weapon, brothers and sisters of Christ. So I'm going to go ahead and end that here, and I pray this reaches a lot of you. And you get the understanding, and it motivates you to get back to the work of the Lord, get back to praying all the time, get back to helping the brethren out whenever you can. Okay? I pray that this really motivates you to start fighting with this weapon here, the Word of the Lord, and start piercing hearts. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.